looks like we are online. Yes, I'm a bit late, I know, I know, but better late than never. Let me go ahead and do my sound check. Okay, I can hear myself there, and can I see my hand? Yes, I can. Okay, camera is functioning and sound is functioning. Then I guess we are good to go. Let me go ahead and unplug this headset and let's get started. So hopefully this time the audio will be better. I did look over the audio from last time and while it was an, an improvement in some ways over the audio from the week before, I did notice there were uh, a couple of issues. I think what I really need is to just invest in a pop filter, so I'm going to see if I can get one of those soon. Uh, other than that, there was something that I still haven't quite solved, which is I hear every now and then this sort of knocking sound, and I think it might just be the sound of like when I put my hand on the desk. Maybe the vibration travels to the microphone because it's sitting on the desk. I would think because of how far away the microphone is that that wouldn't be an issue, but yeah, I don't know what that sound could be other than just me putting my hand on the desk every now and then, kind of like what I'm actually trying to do on purpose right now. If this isn't the cause, if me just tapping the table isn't the cause, then I guess it's some sort of uh, some sort of software side problem that I'm gonna have to try and figure out. But anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at our agenda for today. So I'm looking at a couple of worksheets that I found online that have a bunch of simple harmonic motion problems. One of the worksheets is focused on springs and the other one is focused on pendulums. So that's what I would like to cover for today. Let's go ahead and look at the one for springs. So for springs, it's got, how many questions do I have here? It's got 25. Let's see if we can do all of them. I guess I'm going to keep on looking at the clock and I might adjust as I go because I want to kind of fit in everything. A little bit of everything, that is. But that's enough of me rambling. So first question says we have a load of 45 newtons is attached to a spring that is hanging vertically. The spring is stretched 0.14 meters from its equilibrium position. What is the spring constant? Okay, so that's just a simple, uh, just a simple force problem, really. So we have a spring that has a 45 newton load attached to it, and it's stretched 0.14 meters from equilibrium. So let's say its equilibrium position is here, and this is 0.14 meters, and this thing has 45 newtons of weight to it. Well, then that would mean that it's also got 45 newtons of spring force holding it up. That would mean that there's also 45 newtons of spring force holding it up, so we can just use Hooke's law. Uh, the magnitude of the spring force is equal to the spring constant times, normally we would call it x, but since it's vertical I guess we can call it y. And that's going to be equal to 45 divide by y, which is 0.14 meters, k equals 45 over y equals 45 over 0.14. 
And according to our calculator, that's going to be 45 over 0.14 equals 321.43. 321.43. Newtons per meter, give or take. I usually round it to two decimals, so that's as close as it's going to get for me, unless we encounter a problem where two decimals feel like not enough precision. Number two, if a 60 Newton weight is used instead, what would you expect the spring stretch to be instead? They could have worded that differently. Also, I don't appreciate the fact that they numbered this as problem two instead of making it part B of problem one. But if a 60 Newton weight is used instead, well, now that we have the spring constant, we can just solve for the new Y. So I'm going to do Uh, the new weight would have to be 60 newtons equals the spring constant of 321.43 times, I guess I'll call it y nu. <sighs> Saw a little hair there. And if I divide 60 over 321.43, that's 0.18 and then a bunch of sixes, so I guess I'll just round to 0.187 y nu equals 0.187 meters. Okay, actually, I mean, if this is how easy they're going to make them, then we might blow through both problem sets in two hours. I guess I'm going to have to start thinking of what I want to do after that. And I think I already know what it's going to be. Number three, a force of 16 newtons is required to stretch a spring a distance of 40 centimeters from its rest position. What force is required to stretch the same spring twice the distance, three times the distance, and half the distance? So it says, 16 Newton force leads to a 40 centimeter stretch, 40 centimeter stretch, what force is required to stretch the spring twice the distance, you would just require twice the force, you would require 32 Newtons. Uh, three times the distance requires three times the force, and half the distance requires half the force. The, uh, the spring force is linear with distance, so doubling the stretch distance doubles the force, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's an easy one. Number four, if a spring constant is 40 newtons per meter and an object hanging from it stretches 0.5 meters, what is the mass of the object and what is the period of the oscillation when the spring is set into motion? Ooh, okay, so this one has a little bit of a twist, but not too much. So spring constant 40 newtons per meter and an object hanging from it stretches at 0.15 meters. I guess I'm going to draw the spring in two states. Here's the unstretched state, and then here's that same spring stretched out when a mass of, well, we don't know, is attached to it. So that difference is 0.5 meters. And we were told the spring constant is 40 newtons per meter.
what's the mass of the object and what is the period of the oscillation when the spring is set into motion. Oh, wait a minute. I was thinking, okay, when I said this problem would have a bit of a twist to it, I was thinking it was going to ask... I don't know why, for some reason my brain thought it was going to ask for the amplitude of the motion as well, but... On a second reading, I see that's not the case. So never mind. Let's just continue on with it. So the mass of the object, if it takes 0.5 meters, so I guess we'll do K times 0.5, 40 times 0.5 is 20 newtons of spring force is what it takes to support this weight so that's 20 newtons of spring force which means there must be 20 newtons of weight pulling downward on this thing that's going to be equal to mg divide by g and you will have m. So I'm going to do 20 divided by 9.8 and I get 2.04. So mass 2.04 kilograms. Okay, and now they want the period of the oscillation when the spring is set into motion. Period equation for a mass spring system is period equals 2 pi square root of the mass over the spring constant. So that's going to be 2 pi square root of 2.04 over 40. Is that even readable on the screen? Let me see. Eh, kind of blurry. It's supposed to say 2.04 up here and 40 up here. And you can rewind later through the uh, recording when I upload it to YouTube in case you uh, need, you need to hear me uh, state the values again. If anything is unreadable, just uh, rewind in the video and go by what I say, even though sometimes I say things while writing down other things, so also keep an eye out for that if you catch any mistakes. Make sure to comment. Anyway, plugging in numbers, I've got 2 pi square root 2.04 over 40. And I'm getting 1.4189, so I'm going to round that to 1.419, I guess. So I'll get one point four one nine seconds for the period of oscillation and if we were asked for the frequency we would just do one divided by that and we'd have the frequency in units of Hertz all right number five says a four kilogram mass on a spring is stretched and released the period of oscillation is measured to be 0.46 seconds what is the spring constant? So basically the reverse of what we just did. I guess I will do that over here. So mass is four kilograms. Period is 0.46 seconds. and they want the spring constant. So period equals two pi square root mass over spring constant, 
equals 2 pi square root 4 over k. The most common mistake with this type of problem is forgetting when you square both sides, because we're trying to get rid of the square root, a lot of people forget to square the 2 and the pi in 2 pi. So that's something to watch out for. I would recommend dividing first, so I'm going to write 0.46 over 2 pi equals root 4 over k. Square both sides, that gets me 0.46 squared. Whatever that is, we'll check it out with the calculator in a minute, over 4 pi squared. If you square the 2, you get 4. If you square the pi, you get pi squared. And that equals 4 over k. And we can cross multiply and solve for k. So if I multiply the k over to the left and divide 0.46 squared over to the right and also multiply 4 pi squared over to the right, then I would get k equals uh, 4 pi squared times 4 over 0.46 squared. Plugging that into my calculator. 4 pi squared times 4 over 0.46 squared. I hear some sort of high-pitched noise. Hmm, I can't tell if that's from outside or from my neighbor upstairs. Hopefully the microphone isn't picking it up. I can imagine that can get annoying, but if the microphone is picking it up, then sorry about that. I'm going to have to look into uh, the noise suppression feature of OBS because uh, it's getting warmer and I'm probably going to have a source of noise pretty soon because I'm probably going to have to start turning on a fan. But today is not one of those days, so that'll have to wait. Maybe next week. Anyway, K is... I'm getting 746.28. I'm getting... K equals 746... Point two eight newtons per meter. If your mass is in kilograms and your period is in seconds, then your spring constant will be in newtons per meter. Those are the standard units that you're supposed to have, and if you're not sure how the units change, if your mass is given in grams, for example, then uh, just make sure to convert everything to standard units first so that you can eliminate the guesswork from it. Number six, a 0.5 kilogram object vibrates at the end of a spring with a spring constant of 82 newtons per meter. What is the period of its vibration? So they have a 0.5 kilogram object. Oh, this one is really straightforward. It's not going to require much space on the paper. So we need to calculate the period again. 2 pi square root. And they told us the mass is 0.5 kilograms. over the spring constant they told us was 82 newtons per meter. So 2 pi square root 0.5 over 82. Come to think of it, I know this is a bit of a tangent, but Maybe the source of the noise I was hearing with last week's recording has something to do with 
when my computer starts making that whirring sound. I mean, it's a typical computer noise, but it could mean that the computer is temporarily just going into, like, I don't know how to word it. It's, what's the term? Why am I blanking on it right now? It's going into like high CPU usage temporarily because it's hitting a snag or something. That might have something to do with the noise, but anyway, I'm gonna move on. So plugging in the numbers, I'm getting 0.49 seconds, 0.49 seconds. And that takes care of number six. Number seven, a 0.7 kilogram object vibrates at the end of a horizontal spring with constant 75 newtons per meter along a frictionless surface. Finally, they're asking for something new. What is the frequency of the vibration? Let's switch to a new sheet. So mass 0.7 kilograms, spring constant 75, and this time they want the frequency. So frequency is one over the period. So what I like to do, instead of memorizing both the frequency and period equations for uh, springs and pendulums, is to just memorize one of them. In my case, I prefer to memorize the period equation and just take the reciprocal after you're done calculating it. So, yeah, if you prefer frequency equals one over two pi square root k over m, then be my guest, but I'm just gonna use period equals two pi square root m over k. and then take one over that when I'm done. So I'm gonna do two pi square root of 0.7 over 75, it looks like. 0.7 kilograms over 75 newtons per meter. Two pi times the square root of 0.7 over 75. I'm getting 0.607. I'm getting 0.607. And that's in seconds. And then for the frequency, I'm just going to do 1 over that 0.607. Which gives me 1 over 0 0.607 gives me 1.647 gives me 1.647 hertz HZ. And of course, you can also call them seconds to the negative one or one over seconds if you prefer or if that's what your teacher insists on. But they're all the same unit. Number, which one were we at? We just finished seven. Number eight says, if the object in spring from problem number six were transported to a planet with twice the mass, and the same radius as Earth, what would the frequency of the vibration be? So having twice the mass and the same radius would probably have an effect on the acceleration due to gravity there. And that isn't going to matter. Gravity isn't a factor here. We see the frequency and period equations. I don't 
don't see gravity in there, do you? It's just mass and the spring constant determining the frequency and the period. Nothing else. And it wouldn't matter even if it was a vertical spring as opposed to a horizontal one. It doesn't matter. Mass spring systems are unaffected by changes in gravity. At least, their period and frequency are unaffected. Uh, energy and amplitude could be affected. But that's not what it's asking about. The pendulum, which we will see later, would be affected. A pendulum, period for a pendulum, is square root L over G. So yeah, G is a factor for a pendulum. T for a pendulum. A pendulum would certainly be affected by the acceleration due to gravity changing, but not a mass spring system. And for a pendulum later on, I expect to see a problem where they tell us that the mass attached to the pendulum changes. And as you can see here, just giving you a heads up now, mass is not in here. If you change the mass on a simple pendulum, you're not going to see any change in the uh, period or frequency of the motion. So just something to keep in mind for later. Number nine, an 8.8 .8 Newton object vibrates at the end of, wait, actually, we haven't fully answered number eight yet. It said, if the object and spring from problem number six were transported to a planet with twice the mass and the same radius as Earth, what would the frequency of the vibration be? So in number six, we calculated the period. So now it's asking for the frequency. So take one over the result from earlier. Uh, it was 0.49 seconds. So one over 0.49 frequency is like 2.02 .02 or something like that. Let me go ahead and put it into the calculator to double, to double check. Uh, 2.04 it looks like. Okay, now we can move on to number nine, which says an 8.8 .8 Newton object vibrates at the end of a horizontal spring along a frictionless surface. If the period of vibration is 1.1 seconds, what is the spring constant? We already did something like this. The only difference right now is that they did not give us the mass directly. They told us that it's an 8.8 .8 Newton object, so they didn't tell us m, they told us mg. mg is 8.8 .8 Newtons, and the spring constant is what they want us to find, and the period was given as 1.1 seconds. Find the spring constant. Okay, so divide by g to get m, so m would be 8.8 .8 over 9.8. I'm getting 0 0.898. I'm getting 0 0.898 kilograms. And now we can go ahead and calculate k, so uh, we'd have period 1.1 equals 2 pi square root mass over spring constant divide by 2 pi square both sides so 1.1 squared over 4 pi squared equals 0.898 over k, 
and rearrange and solve for k. You've seen this before, so I won't uh, get too bogged down by the details. I'm going to get 0.898 times 4 pi squared divided by 1.1 squared equals, I'm getting 29.30. I'm getting k equals 29.30 newtons per meter. I was almost about to write newtons, which would have been the wrong unit. Number 10. A one kilogram object vibrates at the end of a vertical spring. If the frequency of the vibration is 1.25 hertz, what is the spring constant? Another variation on the same type of problem, we are still solving for k. Except this time we are given the mass and frequency. Okay, so you could whip out the frequency equation, or you can just convert the frequency to period and use the period equation, which is what I'm going to do, because again, you don't, you don't need to memorize both the frequency equation and the period equation for a spring and a pendulum. As long as you remember that frequency and period have a reciprocal relationship to each other, you'll be fine. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do period equals 1 over the frequency, which they told us is 1.25 hertz. 1 over 1.25 is going to be 0.8, and that's going to be in units of seconds. Mass was given as 1 kilogram. And the rest plays out just like what we see over there. So I'm going to do 0.8 equals 2 pi square root 1 over k. Divide by 2 pi, square both sides. So I get 0.8 squared over, if I square the 2 pi, I get 4 pi squared equals 1 over k. So I guess in this case I can just take the reciprocal on both sides. It's a little bit easier because the numerator is 1. And I would get k over 1 equals 4 pi squared over 0.8 squared. So 4 pi squared divided by 0.8 squared and I'm getting 61.685, I'll round that to 61.69. So I'm getting k equals 61.69 newtons per meter. And that takes care of number 10. Number 11. An object vibrates at the end of a horizontal spring with spring constant 115 newtons per meter along a frictionless surface. If the frequency of the vibration is 1.5 hertz, what is the mass of the object? Frequency given, spring constant given, this time we're solving for mass. So. Again, I'm going to do the same thing I did up here. First off, I'm going to calculate period from the frequency. So 1 over frequency was 1.5 hertz. 1 over 1.5 is going to be 2 thirds, or I guess I'll round it to 0.667. And that's in units of seconds. And spring constant was given as 115 newtons per meter. 
So period 0.667 equals 2 pi square root mass over spring constant. Divide by 2 pi, square both sides, and I guess we'll be multiplying by, 50, uh, by 115. So 0.667 squared over 4 pi squared equals m over 115. All we have to do is multiply the 115 over to the left and plug in our numbers to get our mass in kilograms. 0.667 squared over 4 pi squared all times 115. Oh my, that's, oh, 0.667. I missed the decimal point somehow and ended up typing 667. I was about to say uh, 1.3 million sounds like a lot. <laughs> Okay, 1.30 kilograms, there we go. So I'm getting mass equals about 1.30 kilograms. I guess I'll write it over here. 1.30 kilograms. And that's number 11. Number 12, which of the following mass spring systems will have the highest frequency of vibration? And they say case A is a spring with constant 300 newtons per meter and a mass of 200 grams versus case B, a spring with constant 400 newtons per meter and a mass of 200 grams suspended. So let me switch to, I guess it's been a while since I've used pink or fuchsia or whatever this specific shade is called. Uh, so case A, K equals 300 newtons per meter and mass equals 200 grams versus case B where K equals 400 and mass equals still 200 grams. They could have made it more interesting by giving us different masses. Maybe they'll do that later, but I have my doubts. Actually looking ahead, it doesn't look like they ever will do that. So if we simply look at, so they wanted us to compare the frequency, but I'm going to compare the periods. So if we just plug into the uh, period equation, Let's see, uh, I guess I'll write it over here, period equals 2 pi square root m over k. Okay, if the mass is the same in both cases, then the only thing changing is the spring constant if we divide by a bigger spring constant in case B, then dividing by a bigger number means that overall you're going to get something smaller. Dividing by 400 gives you something smaller than what you'd get when dividing by 300. So then that would mean B would be the smaller period and since there's an inverse relationship between period and frequency, smaller period means higher frequency. If you had a period of four, you'd have a frequency of one fourth. If you had a period of three, you would have a frequency of one third. That smaller period gives a higher frequency because one third is higher than one fourth. 
I know that's probably intuitive to a lot of you, but it, there's no shame in having to walk through the steps mentally for the first few times before you can start doing it really quickly in your head. So yeah, case A is going to have the lower frequency, higher period, lower frequency. Case B is going to have lower period, higher frequency, and it was asking for highest frequency, so it would be case B. B, higher frequency. Higher frequency. All right, that takes care of one of these comparison problems, but we have another one. We have another one to look at. So it says, which of the following mass spring systems will have the highest frequency of vibration yet again, but this time, case A, we've got 300 newtons per meter for the spring constant, and mass is 200 grams versus case B is K equals 300 newtons per meter again. But this time the mass is 100 grams. And we can look at the period equation Again, if the spring constants are the same, then we don't need to worry about it when making our comparison. The only basis for comparison that we need is the mass in this case. So we can see since the mass is in the numerator, higher mass means higher period, and higher period means lower frequency. So the one with the lower mass is going to have the lower period and the higher frequency, so that's going to be B again. B uh, has a higher frequency, yet again. Number 14 says a spring oscillates with a 0.5 kilogram mass at the same frequency as a 2.4 meter long pendulum on Earth. What is the spring constant? I guess, do I want to... Yeah, I'll do it on a new sheet. I don't think I'm going to have enough space down here for anything more. I mean, I try to get the most out of my paper, but I don't want to get too ridiculous. I mean, some of you might think that I'm already a bit too uh, conservative with my paper usage, especially after uh, what I did last week, I think, was when I was really aggressive about min-maxing my uh, paper real estate. But anyway... A spring with 0.5 kilogram mass attached oscillates at the same frequency as a 2.4 meter long pendulum on Earth. Well, if it has the same frequency, then it also has the same period. So again, I can just use the period equations for a simple pendulum and a mass spring system. So I'm going to do 2 pi square root m over k must equal 2 pi square root l over g. The two pi's will cancel in this case, and in fact if I square both sides the square roots will also cancel, so I'm just left with m over k 
equals L over G. And we are trying to solve for K. So mass was given as 0.5 kilograms. Length was given as 2.4 meters for the simple pendulum. And meters are the standard units. And they said it was on Earth, so G is 9.8 meters per second squared. And multiply the K over to the right and move everything else over to the left. So K is going to be 0.5 times 9.8 over 2.4. 0.5 times 9.8 over 2.4 is 2.04. K equals 2.04 newtons per meter. Is it the sound of me putting the markers down? That might be the source of the knocking sound I was hearing in the audio from last week. No, that can't be the case, because I know what that sounds like when I'm listening to the video playback. Sorry, I keep on referring back to this thing because I'm, I'm trying to solve the mystery, and when I'm re-watching the video recording of this, I want it would help me if I'm commenting on the things that I'm doing that could potentially be making the noise. That might help me pinpoint what exactly is going on. So forgive me if that's becoming uh, too annoying uh, for you to hear me just keep talking about that every couple minutes. It's to make sure that we can try and get better audio for future sessions. So in the long run, it will be worth it, I hope. Anyway, scrolling down to 15. Huh. This was supposed to be mostly spring problems, but they're mentioning pendulums again. So it says, what is the acceleration due to gravity on a planet where a 1.5 meter long pendulum oscillates with the same period as a 0.8 kilogram mass vibrates on an, eight, on an 80 newton per meter spring. Okay, we'll just use the same relationship we have here. So, I guess I'll switch to yellow. That is barely even visible on the screen. I think the yellow might be dying. Well, I'll see what happens when I try to actually write something with it. Uh, I've lost my position on the page. Where was it? Number 15. Okay, acceleration due to gravity on a planet where a 1.5 meter long pendulum, so uh, if you set the periods or the frequencies equal to each other, you're going to get some version of this relationship. So I'll skip over that since we've seen it already. M over K equals L over G. The yellow marker still has some fight left in it, sadly. And plug in the numbers, we got 1.5 meters for the length over the G is unknown. And then the mass was 0.8 kilograms over the spring constant was 80 newtons. Okay, and rearranging this for G, I guess I would multiply the G over to the left and move everything else to the right. 
So g is equal to 1.5 times 80 over 0 0.8. 1.5 times 80 over 0.8 is 150. I'm getting g equals 150 newtons per meter. And I could very easily add a follow-up to this question and ask if this is on the surface of a planet with, let's say, three times the radius of Earth, what is the average density of that planet relative to the density of the Earth? I could ask a follow-up question like that. But I won't. Not today. We already did some density stuff last week. Number 16. A 0.5 kilogram object vibrates at the end of a vertical spring with constant 82 newtons per meter. What is the period of its vibration? How far does the spring stretch when the mass is placed on it? And what is the stored potential energy in the spring? Okay, that's a bit different, but not too hard. Uh, let's do green. Oh, and come to think of it, did I write newtons per meter here? What am I doing? It's not newtons per meter. G is in meters per second squared. Glad I caught that. It's because I've written newton, newtons per meter for the units for the final answers for so many of these problems. I guess that just goes to show that it happens even to the best. There is no graduating from making mistakes. That's something that's going to follow you for the rest of your life. But as I always tell my students, what you can do is you can get better at catching your mistakes. Just develop habits of double checking and triple checking and develop a sense for when a number feels too big or too small. Develop a habit of just doing a double take when you see anything that feels unusual and you're more likely to catch mistakes that way. Anyway, we were given mass is 0.5 kilograms and the spring constant is 82 newtons per meter. Period of vibration shouldn't be too hard to calculate. 2 pi square root 0.5 over 82. I feel like we might have already seen these numbers before, did we? I feel like we saw these numbers somewhere. Yeah, 0.5 over 82, 0.49 seconds. And that takes care of the first part. It also wants us to figure out how far does the spring stretch when the mass is placed on it. Now, there are two ways to interpret this question. I'm pretty sure that the intention of the writer was for you to answer how far the spring stretches uh, in order to reach its new equilibrium position. So pretty much the same scenarios we had in the first few questions set the weight of the object equal to k times x, or in this case, k times y, 
and solve for y. I'm pretty sure that was the intention, but they could also be asking us if the spring was just hanging vertically like this and you attach the mass while it's at this length and you let it go, how far does it go? In that case, it'll go down, it'll reach equilibrium, but it'll also have a downward velocity at this point and it'll then keep going down a little bit further and then come back up. And if that's what they're asking, if they're asking how far does it go when it goes all the way down, as it, if they're assuming that it starts oscillating up and down, and they're asking what's the farthest down it goes from its actual uh, original length, then that's going to be twice as long. That's going to be twice as long if you attach a mass to a spring that's hanging vertically, it will have a new, equilibri a new equilibrium position over here where uh, the spring force is equal to the weight. But if it has some velocity when it gets to this point, then which it will, then it will continue to oscillate back and forth with some sort of amplitude. And if you attached the mass while it was up here and you released it from rest, then it should go uh, down to here and then down just as far to somewhere over here and oscillate like that. If you gave it some sort of initial velocity when you hooked it up here and let it drop, if instead of simply dropping it, you gave it some sort of initial velocity, then all bets are off unless you know what that initial velocity is. But if it was initially at rest, it would go down to uh, two times the distance to the new equilibrium position. So whatever this distance is, this is actually the this is actually going to be the amplitude of the motion again if you attach the block and let it pull the spring down from rest. I'm assuming though that it's going to be the, that first interpretation so it's going to be mg equals ky as we've seen before and solve for y, so mg over k. mg over k is going to be 0.5 times 9.8 over 82. And I'm getting 0 0.0597, I'm going to say 0 0.060. I'm getting y equals 0 0.060 newtons per meter. That will be our new equilibrium position. Okay, I guess I'm not blowing through these as fast as I anticipated, so we might have to actually speed things up. Uh, let me see what else it was asking. What is the stored potential energy in the spring? If it stretches this far, then just one half kx squared. Potential energy stored in a spring that has been stretched that far from its equilibrium position, one half kx squared, one half 82 times, well, I guess in this case, one half ky squared, but 0 0.060 0 squared. If we plug in our numbers, we get half of 82 is 41 times 0 0.06 squared. I'm getting 0.1476. and that would be in units of joules. And there's our three answers, period, stretch distance, and uh, 
spring force. All right, number 17 says a 0.7 kilogram object vibrates at the end of a horizontal spring with constant 75 newtons per meter. Those also look like familiar numbers. What is the frequency of the vibration? Let me see, I think we already have the period for 0.7 kilograms and yeah, actually, if we already did this, right here, 0.7 kilograms and 75 uh, newtons per meter for our spring constant, we've already got both the period and frequency, 0 0.607 for the period and 1.647 for the frequency. So yeah, already done. Okay, so we'll skip that one because we already did it. 18 and 8.8 .8 Newton object vibrates at the end of a horizontal spring along a frictionless surface. If the period of vibration is 1.1 seconds, what is the spring constant? Again, I think we already did this because those numbers look familiar. Where was my... yeah, we already did 8.8 .8 Newtons, 1.1 seconds for the period. Yeah, we already did that. Okay. Number 19 also looks familiar. One kilogram object, 1.25 hertz frequency. What is the spring constant? Yeah, we already did that. That was number 10. It's almost like they copy pasted their previous questions. Actually, I think it is just straight up a copy paste. Well, there is a little bit of difference in formatting for one of them. But yeah, it looks like they straight up copy pasted here. Huh. Okay, we'll skip 19 as well. What about 20? An object vibrates at the end of a horizontal spring, constant 115 newtons per meter, frequency 1.5 hertz. Those numbers look familiar as well. The previous question with those numbers was asking for the mass, and this one is also asking for the mass. Huh. Okay, maybe it was intentional repetition. I don't know what the goal of the author of these questions was, but I'll make sure to make a note of this for myself so that the next time I assign this worksheet to students of mine, I don't make them go through so many of the same questions twice. They'll probably realize it on their own A 0.4 kilogram mass, 21 says, a 0.4 kilogram mass vibrates with a frequency of 1 hertz at the end of a spring. If the 0.4 kilogram mass is replaced by a 0.8 kilogram mass, what is the frequency of the vibration? Okay, this one is new. At least it's a new type of question. So the mass is doubled, essentially. So frequency, I guess I'll call it F0, is equal to 1 hertz, or 1.0 hertz, the way they wrote it, if you care about your sig fig rules. Usually we leave that for the chemists, but if you have that one physics teacher that's also a stickler for sig figs, then know that it's reported as 1.0. I guess I should have also mentioned it for previous problems as well, but 
As long as you learn the uh, process, don't get too hung up on the numbers. As long as you learn the process, you'll be able to work out the sig figs for whatever your teacher throws at you. Anyway, uh, so it's a frequency of 1 hertz. Initially, the mass is 0.4 kilograms. Replace the mass with 0.8 kilograms. And they did not mention, but I would assume that the mass is attached to a spring and not a simple pendulum. Assuming it's attached to a spring, we can say that uh, period is 2 pi square root m over k. If I double the mass, I guess we'll say period 0 equals 2 pi times m0 over k. And I guess we'll call it period star is equal to 2 pi square root m star over k equals 2 pi square root times 2m0 over k. If you factor out the 2 from the square root, then that's square root of 2 times 2 pi times the square root of m0 over k. But we already know that all of this is equal to t0, right? t0 is 2 pi square root m0 over k. So t star is root 2 times t0. So t star equals root 2 times t0, which means 1 over t star is equal to 1 over root 2 times 1 over t0, which means that f star, the new frequency, is equal to 1 over square root 2 times 1 over t0 would be f0, the old frequency. And there you go. Now, if you practice this type of problem enough, you'll be able to just immediately decide whether it increases or decreases by a factor of 1 or 2 or square root of 2. But these are the steps if you want to go through it step by step. Eventually, once you practice it enough times, you will be able to just immediately see thing in the numerator doubles, you get a square root 2 on the outside. Thing in the denominator doubles, you get 1 over square root 2 on the outside, and then flip if you're looking at frequency as opposed to period. Takes a bit of practice, but not too much. Number 22. After a bungee jump, a 75 kilogram student bobs up and down at the end of the bungee cord at a frequency of 0.23 hertz. What is the spring constant of the cord? Uh, we've done problems like that, so we'll skip in the interest of getting closer to those pendulum problems. 23. A 0 0.025 kilogram object vibrates in simple harmonic motion at the end of a spring. If the maximum displacement of the object is 0 0.03 centimeters and its period is 0.5 seconds, what is the maximum acceleration of the object? Ooh. You may have noticed, in addition to gravity, amplitude is also not a factor in determining the period of an object attached to a spring in simple harmonic motion. 
2 pi square root m over k. Amplitude has nothing to do with it. So you can't directly use the amplitude and connect it to frequency and period. At least not directly, but it can still be used. There might be a way to use it here. So let me read again. 0 0.025 kilogram object vibrating at the end of a spring. If the maximum displacement, the amplitude, is 0 0.03 centimeters and period is 0 0.5, what is the maximum acceleration of the object? So we need to get the maximum acceleration. We actually have a number of different routes we could take here. I'm pretty sure we have multiple different routes we can take. So we could we could try to determine the spring constant. We have the period and the mass, so we could just calculate the spring constant. And then we could use the spring constant, multiply it by the amplitude, so the 0 0.03 centimeters, and that would give us the maximum spring force and then divide by the mass and that would give us the maximum acceleration. So we could go that route. We could also take advantage of our uh, time-dependent functions for simple harmonic motion, which are x of t equals amplitude times some trig function. Uh, usually I, pref I prefer to use cosine, but it'll work just fine with sine as well. Amplitude, cosine, omega t plus phi, and then v of t from that would be a negative, I forgot my negative sign, I'll just write it in here, amplitude times negative omega sine omega t plus phi. That looks all smushed together, that's no good. And then acceleration of t is equal to amplitude times, or I missed the negative again, amplitude times negative omega squared cosine of omega t plus phi. And if we use this, then we can just say that the maximum acceleration is equal to the magnitude of a times negative omega squared. So I guess throw out the negative and we can say acceleration maximum is equal to amplitude times omega squared. And we would do that by assuming that cosine omega t plus phi, whatever t and phi happen to be, uh, you know that the maximum value of cosine is 1, or I guess in this case negative 1 to cancel out that negative sign, but either way, you can just set the value of the trig function to 1. And if we do it this way, then we don't actually have to calculate k. If we do it this way, then we don't actually have to calculate k, because if we know the period is 0.5 seconds, if we know t is equal to 0.5 seconds, then we can calculate the angular frequency, omega, is simply equal to 2 pi over t. or equal to 2 pi frequency is the version of the equation that I prefer to memorize and then replace frequency with 1 over period to get the period version. Again, it's one of those, you've got two different equations, pick one and commit that one to memory and to get the other one just take the reciprocal of your frequency or period.
Uh, but yeah, uh, I guess we'll use the 2 pi over t version since we've already written it down for convenience. And, well, we know what 2 pi is, we know what the period is. So, yeah, we have the angular frequency. Uh, plug it in here, square it, and multiply it by the amplitude, and you're done. You don't even have to take the intermediate step of determining k. You can do it. You can absolutely do what we've been doing. Period equals 2 pi square root m over k, plug in m and plug in uh, period and solve for k, but we've done that enough times, so might as well try a new approach. So amplitude was 0 0.03 centimeters. Uh, I guess I'll keep it in centimeters in this case. Just write down that it's in centimeters. Times omega squared, so 2 pi over 0.5 uh, 2 over 0.5 is 4, so that's going to be 4 pi for the angular frequency, and if I square it, that's going to be 16 pi squared, which is almost 160. 16 times pi squared is 157.9, uh, 157.91, so 157.91. And that's going to be in units of uh, radians per second. And if we square that, that's radians squared per second squared. And the radians aren't really units. They're just kind of placeholder units. So units of inverse seconds squared. So centimeters times 1 over seconds squared gives you centimeters per second squared, which is why we can actually get away with not converting the amplitude to meters here. Uh, 0 0.03 times 157.91 is 4.7373. I'll just round it to 4.74. So acceleration, and I haven't left any room for it here. I'll write it over here. A max is equal to 4.7. Four centimeters per second squared. Okay, second to last question on this list says a block is attached to a spring with unknown spring constant and oscillates with a period of two seconds. What is the period if the mass is doubled, if the mass is halved, if the amplitude is doubled, and if the spring constant is doubled? Well, we already examined a situation like that. So they're asking what happens to the period. If the mass is doubled, we saw that earlier. If the mass is doubled, then the period becomes square root two times as high. So whatever you do to the mass, in this case doubling it, then you do square root of that to the period. If the period is originally 2 seconds, then at double the mass, it's 2 seconds times square root of 2. At half the mass, it's 2 seconds times the square root of 1 half. If the amplitude is doubled, nothing happens. Amplitude is not a factor in determining the period. So ski, or C, the period is still 2 seconds if the amplitude is doubled, it doesn't change. And if the spring constant is doubled, uh, doubling the spring constant, if your spring constant is in the denominator, then it's essentially the same as what you would get if the mass was halved. So you would just have square root one half times the two seconds. Hopefully you can see that immediately, but if not, just play around with it the same way we did in this problem and uh, you'll figure it out. And with enough practice again, you will be able to do it pretty quickly like I'm 
doing right now. Number 25, last one before we look at the next worksheet, it says a 200 gram air track glider is attached to a spring. The glider is pushed 0.1 meters against the spring, then released. A student with a stopwatch finds that 10 oscillations take 12 seconds. What is the spring constant? So I don't think I'm going to actually work this one out completely, but I will work out the first step. They said 10 oscillations in 12 seconds. So how many seconds is it per oscillation? I would just do the total seconds, 12 divided by the total oscillations, 10. And that gives me 1.2 seconds per full oscillation. This is the period. Set that equal to 2 pi square root m over k. You know m, it's uh, 200 grams or 0.2 if you convert it to kilograms and solve for k. Note that the amplitude they gave you, the fact that it was pushed 0.1 meters against the spring before release, doesn't matter. Amplitude is not a factor in the period or frequency equations. And there we go. That is the final question on that set. Let's move on to the pendulum worksheet, which has 23 questions in total, and I bet some of them are going to be repeats. So let's see what we can do here. A pendulum is observed to complete 32 full cycles in 56 seconds. Calculate a period, frequency, and length. They want period, frequency, and length. Which color haven't I used in a while? I don't think I've used this one. Okay, so we're assuming here that this pendulum is on Earth. If they don't mention any other planet or any different uh, acceleration due to gravity, we can just assume that G is our familiar 9.8, which is going to be needed for uh, calculating period and frequency. Er, well, actually, no, it's not needed for calculating period and frequency here. It's going to be needed for uh, part C, calculating the length. So we've got 32 cycles in 56 seconds. So I'm going to do the total time, 56 seconds, divided by the total number of oscillations, 32, 56 over 32. is 1.75 1.75 seconds per oscillation. This is the period of the oscillation. Frequency is just going to be 1 over that, so 1 over 1.75 gives me 0.57 hertz, so frequency as 1 over period is going to be 1 over 1.75 equals 0.57 hertz. And calculate the length. So I'm going to use the period equation for a simple pendulum. Period equals 2 pi square root L over G divide by 2 pi and square both sides. So I'm going to have period, which is 1.75 seconds, over 2 pi equals square root L over 9.8. Square both sides, and I guess I'm going to multiply the 9.8 over to the left. So I'm going to have 1.75 squared over, that's going to be 4 pi squared, and then all that times 9.8 gives me a length of 0.76. So length 
0.76 meters. Two, a pair of trapeze performers at the circus is swinging from ropes attached to a large elevated platform. Swinging from ropes attached to a large elevated platform. Okay, suppose that the performers can be treated as a simple pendulum with a length of 16 meters. Determine the period for one complete back and forth cycle. Okay. They told us the length. We can assume g to be 9.8. Just plug into the period equation for a pendulum. 2 pi square root of 16, it's already in meters, divided by 9.8, and you get your number. I guess I'll, I'll plug it into my calculator just to see what the number will be. 16 over 9.8 square root times 2 pi. I'm getting about 8.028 seconds for the uh, period. So that's number two, pretty quick and simple, especially if you've been paying close attention with the spring problems we've been doing. There's a lot of similarity here. Number three says find the length of a pendulum that has a period of two seconds. We already did something similar to it. We found the length of a pendulum that has a period of 1.75 seconds. So I would expect a slightly higher period, or not a higher period, uh, a slightly higher length for that higher period. Going from 1.75 seconds to two seconds, increase in T with no change in G must mean there's some increase in L, so expecting something around like 0.8 meters, give or take. We'll pass on actually working that one out. Number four, find the length of a pendulum that has a frequency of 0.8 hertz. So I would treat it essentially the same way that I treat uh, that I treated the other problems from the springs worksheet. When given frequency, I just convert it to period. Period equals one over frequency equals one over uh, 0.8, I think is what they gave us. Did I copy that right? Yeah, 0.8 hertz. One over 0.8 is 1.25 seconds. And then, assuming this is on Earth, we know how to do the rest. 1.25 equals 2 pi square root L over 9.8. Yeah, we've seen all this before, so we'll skip on the rest of that problem. Number five, the acceleration due to gravity on the moon is 1.6 meters per second squared. How long of a pendulum would be required to have a period of one second? How long of a pendulum would be required to have a period of one second? So it's essentially the same as three, or at this point, I think four of our past problems. Only difference is replace the 9.8 with 1.6, and it's the same process. So yeah, I think, well, I'll go ahead and calculate it just out of curiosity. So it's going to be period we want to be one second divided by 2 pi. And then if we square that, that's 1 over 4 pi squared. And then times, instead of 9.8, I'm going to do 1.6. And I'm getting a length of 0 0.04 meters. 0 0.04 meters, or just 4 centimeters. Did 
Did I do my math right? I know that was kind of rushed. Let me see, one over two pi, and then if I square that, I get one squared over four pi squared, and then times, yeah, I did it right. I followed all the right steps, and I typed everything correctly into my calculator too. Okay, number six, the bob of a pendulum has a mass of 0.25 kilograms. If this pendulum is one meter long, what is its frequency? At least this is a little bit different. Calculate frequency. So we're just gonna calculate period and then take one over that. Two pi square root of, uh, what was the length? One meter? over 9.8. They mentioned the mass of the pendulum bob, but it doesn't matter. And we get two pi square root one over 9.8 equals 2.007 and if I do 1 over 2.007, so I'll go ahead and write down that this came out to 2.007 seconds, and frequency then is 1 over 2.007 is equal to 0.0001. Point four nine eight hertz. And the mass has nothing to do with it. Number seven says in, or I guess it's supposed to say if, the pendulum of problem number six. Oh, never mind. I missed that comma. In the pendulum of problem number six, the bob is replaced with a 0.5 kilogram bob. If the length is unchanged, what is the frequency? 0.498, unchanged. The mass has nothing to do with it. Increasing the mass will increase the force of gravity pulling on the pendulum, but it also increases the force of gravity required to pull the pendulum. It's just like that question of if a two kilogram ball will fall faster than a five kilogram ball if both released from rest from the same height above the ground they both fall at the same time, as long as their shape isn't such that they catch too much air resistance, they should both fall at roughly the same time. One has more mass, but also requires more mass and, or not requires more mass, requires more force and so all that extra gravitational force acting on the heavier object is compensated for by the fact that you have more inertia. It doesn't matter if you have double the mass when you also have double the cost to achieve the same acceleration. Number eight. What is the period of a pendulum on a four meter long string with a six kilogram mass? You can ignore the six kilogram mass. It doesn't matter. Uh, two pi square root L over G, so that would be two pi square root of four over 9.8. So I guess it would be two times this, right? Because two pi square root one over 9.8 is 2.007. So if I replace that one with a four, if I quadruple the length, then I get square root four times the period. Square root four is two, so I would get 4.014 seconds, and I can see that without even having to bring out the calculator. 
Number nine, which would have the highest frequency of vibration and why? It says prove mathematically, so I guess they want you to actually calculate so they've got pendulum A has a 200 gram mass attached to a one meter length of string and pendulum B has a 400 gram mass attached to a 0.5 meter length of string. So let's wall that off. I think I'll switch to this darker color. They said pendulum A has mass 200 grams, length 1 meter, versus pendulum B has mass 400 grams, length 0.5 meters. Well, we know the mass doesn't matter, so all we're comparing off of is the length. We can see from the period equation for a simple pendulum, greater length leads to greater period, which means greater length leads to lower frequency. So the one with the greater length is the one meter, which means it's gonna have the lower frequency, so B is our winner here. B is our winner. This one has the higher frequency, lower period. Higher frequency. I know it said prove mathematically, so I guess uh, for the sake of the way this was worded, you would actually just plug in the numbers and show that the periods and by extension, the frequencies that you can calculate from those periods are different and pick out the higher frequency. Nothing too fancy going on there. Number 10, Anna wishes to make a simple pendulum that serves as a timing device. She plans to make it such that its period is one second on earth. What length must the pendulum have? for a period of one second. Well, we've done a number of these already. I would expect it to be, let's see if we have, well, I know that a length of one meter gets you a period of almost two seconds, a little bit more. So if I wanted half that period, I would need a half squared of the length. So, you're gonna get a length of about 0.25, a little bit lower, maybe 0.24-ish, so that you can get rid of that little bit after the decimal point. So yeah, we've seen calculations like this a number of times before. You know what to do there. I won't bother, but I expect the number to be somewhere around 0.24, 0.25-ish meters. Number 11 looks like a follow-up. Anna takes her pendulum to planet B that has twice the mass of Earth with the same radius as Earth. What is the period of her pendulum on planet B? Now the mass of the pendulum bob doesn't matter, but the mass of the planet you're on certainly matters because it affects the value of G. It affects how much gravitational acceleration the pendulum experiences. So if you're on a planet with the same radius but double the mass, then you're experiencing double the gravitational force. And if you're doubling G, then that's multiplying by two in the denominator of a square root, which means the period would decrease by a factor of, well, let's see, so you'd be multiplying it by square root of one half. So you can either say decreasing by a factor of root two or multiplied by a factor of root one half. 
square root of one half times it was supposed to be one second I guess I can do that calculation real quick one times the square root of 1 over 2 is 0 0.7071 It'll have a period of about 0.707 seconds on planet B. Number 12 says that next, Anna travels to planet C that has half the mass of Earth with a radius twice that of Earth. What is the period on planet C? Okay, so now we have a little bit of extra math to do. Let's actually work this one out. So planet C, we've got, well, in general, force of gravity near the surface of a planet is equal to m, well, is mg equal to big G, mass of the planet, mass of the object over uh, the radius of the planet squared. The mass of the object cancels out. So you're left with g, mass of the planet, over r squared. So we're looking for, I guess we'll call it g star, or I guess we can call it gc actually, is equal to big G mc over rc squared. I don't even know if that's really readable on the screen. Yeah, that's not very readable over there. Sorry for that. Bumped into the table and shook the screen a bit. Uh, maybe if I do a darker color, or not even a darker color, one of my finer tipped markers. There, that should be a little bit cleaner. And then... Hopefully that's more readable, and that R is barely visible to me, so I'm going to rewrite it like that. Okay, so compared to G Earth, that would just be big G mass of Earth over radius of Earth squared, so let's see, G of C, I guess I'll write it over here, G of C equals big G times, they said half the mass, yeah one-half mass Earth, and then they said twice the radius of Earth, so two radius of Earth squared. Remember the two is inside your parentheses, it gets squared with the R. So factor out the one-half and factor out the two after squaring it, and we get one-half over 2 squared is 4, times big G, mass of Earth, over radius of Earth squared. Well, G, mass of Earth, over radius of Earth squared is just G Earth. So this is 1 half over 4 is 1 eighth. G Earth, or 1 eighth of 9.8. Now from there we can do, what were they asking for? They're asking what is the period on planet C, so from there we can just do the period equation. Period equals 2 pi square root, the length will be the same as before, but the g will be one eighth as high. So if you've got one eighth in the denominator of a square root, then t on planet C is equal to square root of one over one eighth. So square root of eight times t earth. 
So square root of 8 times the pendulum was meant to have a period of 1 second, so square, square root of 8 times 1. And I guess I might as well plug it in because it's a really quick calculation. So square root of 8, 2.83. You would get 2.83 seconds on planet C. Number 13 says, finally, Anna takes her pendulum to planet D. On planet D, Anna's pendulum has a period of 1.4 seconds. Calculate the acceleration due to gravity on planet D. And at least for once they're asking us for something other than the length. We have 1.4 seconds is TD. So what can I do here? I can do equals 1.4 times T Earth equals 1.4 times 2 pi square root L over G, whatever that length was, we never actually calculated it, but that's okay, we don't need to know it. I can move 1.4 into the square root as, uh, let's see, I would have to move it into the G, so I would have to do, I would have to rewrite the 1.4 as the square root of 1.4 squared, and I would have to also move it into the denominator. So I guess that would mean it would become 2 pi square root L over, and then this is going to be 1 over 1.4 squared G. Right, 1 over 1 1.4 squared. If I pull it out of the square root, it just becomes 1 over 1 1.4. Well, it becomes 1.4 because it's already in the denominator, so pulling it out, you'd flip it. Yeah. So then that would mean that g on the new planet, g of planet d, equals 1 over 1 1.4 squared g on planet Earth. And it's a good thing that they stopped with planet D. If they introduced a planet E, then I wouldn't be able to use E for Earth. But there we have it. So 1 over 1 1.4 squared multiplied by 9.8 would be the acceleration due to gravity on planet D. You could have done it more easily if you just kept the uh, length from, which problem was it, from problem uh, 10, but I made it harder on myself because I never bothered to calculate the length in problem 10, which is fine because, again, it can still be done. And actually, I think it's more valuable being able to do it like this without knowledge of the length it's good to know that you have other avenues. Knowing how to work with less is a valuable skill in physics, after all. Okay, somewhere on a distant planet, this is number 14, in case anybody's keeping track. I mean, if you're not one of my students and you've already been handed these worksheets, then I'm not sure how much benefit you'll get from me reading the problem numbers, but I'll try and keep them stated just in case for the sake of staying organized if you're taking notes or whatever. Uh, 14 says, somewhere on a distant planet, a simple pendulum is pulled away from the equilibrium point and released. The pendulum comes back to the point of release exactly 2.4 seconds after the release. If the length of the pendulum 
is 1.3 meters. What is the acceleration due to gravity on the planet? So if it takes exactly 2.4 seconds, then that's the period equals 2 pi square root length they told us was 1.3 meters and solve for g of our mystery planet I'll call it planet x okay divide by 2 pi square both sides 2.4 squared over 4 pi squared equals 1.3 over gx. And let's see, multiply the gx over to the left, move all that stuff on the left over to the right by flipping it, and we would have 1.3 times 4 pi squared over 2.4 squared. And I'm getting 8.91 for gx. gx equals 8.91. And that would be in units of meters per second squared. Standard acceleration units. Number 15, a pendulum has a period of 3.6 seconds. What is the frequency? 1 over 3.6. That's easy enough. 16, a spring vibrates 32 times in 56 seconds. Find its period and frequency. Didn't we already do this one? Wasn't it the first one? Uh, first one was 32 full cycles in 56 seconds. Yeah, 32 times in 56 seconds. It's the same as the very first problem in the list. What did we get? I think we got like 1.75. Is that right? 56 over 32. Yep, 1.75 for the period and 0.57 hertz for the frequency. I should have just looked at my page instead of bringing up the calculator again. I didn't realize that so far I've only been using one page for the whole pendulum worksheet. Maybe we can keep it that way. Although I have my doubts considering how little space I have left. Uh, 17. Find the length of a pendulum on Earth that has a period of two seconds. We did something similar or at least we elaborated on something similar, which was uh, Anna's pendulum for problem 10. Uh, we at least explained how you would go about finding the length for a pendulum with a period of one second on Earth, and if you did calculate that, then you could just multiply by, let's see, if you want double the period, then you would multiply by 4, right? You would need 4 times the length because square root of 4 would give you 2. Yeah, multiplying the period by 2. If you're not changing g, you'd have to multiply the length by 4. So whatever length you got for number 10, if you calculated it, multiply it by 4, and you are done. I mean, as long as it doesn't say show your work, I guess. If you have to show your work, then uh, you still have to go through all the same steps anyway, so... Can't help you there. But if it's a multiple choice question, and you had a previous question, that was similar to it, then yeah, you can take a bit of a shortcut with it. 
Number 18, find the length of a pendulum on Earth that has a frequency of 0.8 hertz. I think we touched on something like that earlier. Yeah, we had... It was simply asking us for the frequency that time. I don't think we calculated length from it, though. Did we? It was number four. Find the length of a pendulum that has a frequency of 0.8 hertz. Yeah, so if we passed on calculating it back in number four, then I guess it's fair to pass on calculating it now. 19. Determine the acceleration due to gravity at a location where a pendulum 0.75 meters long has a frequency of 0.57 hertz. Did we do 0.57? Yeah, 0.57, I knew it was familiar. That means a period of 1.75, which means we can just use that in the period equation. And then I don't think we encountered 0.75 anywhere along the way for length, did we? Looking through the previous problems, I'm not seeing a 0.75. Looking at my written notes, I don't see a 0.75 there either. Okay, we might actually want to do this one then. I mean, it's not too different from what we just did over here with, what was that? That was problem 14. Not too different. So you would have your period 1.75 equals 2 pi square root. Plug in the length and solve for g. Yeah, you know what? It's essentially the same as this problem, so I think we can pass on it. I'll go back to it if none of these other problems have anything interesting to show us. Number 20, acceleration due to gravity on the moon is 1.6 meters per second squared. How long of a pendulum would be required to have a period of one second? Did we do something like that? Yeah, that was number five. Acceleration due to gravity on the moon is 1.6. How long of a pendulum would be required for one second? And we did calculate that, right? It was a really tiny number. Where was it? Oh, I think I just did it by, uh, without writing it on the worksheet. I just plugged it into my calculator. I remember it was very, very short, like 0 0.04 or something like that. Let me look through my calculator history. It's probably still in there. Yep, 0 0.0405 meters. Just a little over four centimeters. Okay, yeah, we did do that one. I just didn't write it down on my worksheet, or not worksheet, what would I call this? I guess I would call this my scratch paper. Uh, 21, the bob of a pendulum has a mass of 0.25 kilograms. If this pendulum is one meter long, what is its frequency? We already did that. One meter on Earth, Frequ uh, period is 2.007, frequency is 0.498 hertz, and the mass does not matter. 22, in the pendulum of problem number 21, the bob is replaced with a 0.5 kilogram bob. If the length is unchanged, what is the frequency? Unchanged. I think they already did ask us this before. And finally, number 23 says, Elwin the bungee clown swings back and forth like a simple pendulum at the end of a bungee cord. If a student determines the time of one complete swing is 6.9 seconds, how long is the bungee cord when Elwin is swinging from it?
We already did plenty of those. We already did plenty of solve for the length given the period. So yeah, let's actually just go back to number 19. Determine acceleration due to gravity at a location where a pendulum 0.75 meters long has a frequency of 0.57 hertz. I would do 1 over 0.57, which gives me a period of about 1.75. And then I would do, let me switch colors here. Uh, let's go for green. I would do 1.75. I guess I'll go ahead and divide by the 2 pi equals the square root of L over 9. Oh, wait. No, 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 no. It's not on Earth. I'll call it GX. I messed that up really badly, but it's okay. I'm about to rewrite it with both sides squared anyway. If I square both sides, then 1.75 squared over, that becomes 4 pi squared, equals length was 0.75 meters over gx, or maybe I should call it gy, so as not to confuse it with that one, but I'm pretty sure that you guys aren't going to be confused by that. We understand that it's a separate problem. Uh, let's see, multiply the gx over to the left and multiply the reciprocal of this over to the right. So we would have gx equals 0.75 times 4 pi squared over 1.75 squared. And that gives me 9.67 approximately. I get gx. equals 9.67 meters per second squared. So if this is on Earth, then it's at some reasonable elevation above the Earth's surface, I would imagine. I guess we could do a follow-up question and ask at which elevation is this? We could just use this over here, g equals gm over r squared, except this time r is more than just the radius of the Earth. You know what? Let's go ahead and do that and solve for r. I'm curious. So if I do, I guess I'll do it in that tiny little corner over there. This right here is all I have to work with. 9.67 equals big G mass of Earth over, I'm just going to call it distance squared. And if I multiply distance squared over to the left and divide the 9.67 over to the right and take the square root, then the distance is equal to square root big G M over 9.67, and I know big G is 6.7 times 10 to the negative 11, or 6. Point, why am I blanking on it right now? 6.73, right? 6.73. times 10 to the negative 11 multiplied by the mass of Earth is about 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms over 9.67 and I get a big number and if I take the square root of that number I get a big number still, and that is going to be the distance, so I guess let me switch to scientific notation mode. 
it would be in scientific notation 6.45 times 10 to the 6 meters and the radius of Earth is about 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. So 6.45 minus 6.38 is 0 0.07 times 10 to the 6 meters. 0 0.07 times 10 to the 6 is 70,000 70, meters above surface level. So D minus radius of Earth equals the altitude h, which is 70,000 meters above the surface of Earth, give or take. Seventy thousand meters, is that even a reasonable elevation that a human could reach? I'm not entirely sure. I don't know the height of Mount Everest off the top of my head, but I guess I can do a quick Google search for it. Height of Mount Everest. And let's see if we can get that in meters. 8,850 meters. So no, you would need, let's see, to reach 70,000, you would need about nine Mount Everests. You would need to climb nine Mount Everests stacked on top of each other to experience that elevation, or I guess get into an airplane. But I don't think even airplanes go that high. So yeah, I guess uh, that's an experiment that you'll have to do on a different planet. Either that or get yourself a private aircraft and go up there to do your experiment. 9.67 meters per second squared is going to require travel that's just a little too high up for your typical human experimenter. But yeah, I think that is where I will wrap things up for today. Hopefully this has been helpful like all the other sessions. And of course, if you have questions that you wanted answered that you didn't see here, remember to show up so that you can ask live. And uh, that'll be it for today. I don't know what I want to do for next week yet, but I will probably figure it out as the week goes. It's probably going to be some sort of AP review, although I might be doing that separately if I can uh, figure out how I want to organize it. I think I've written a pretty good mega problem. At least I have the outline of it, but I actually need to uh, come up with numbers for it. Actually, I'm not even sure if I want to use numbers. I might want the whole question to be expression-based, but we'll see. I'm still fine-tuning it, and if I can get that completed, the next task will be to just kind of figure out an overall structure for the main review. And if I can get all that sorted out in time, then I might be streaming that on YouTube rather than on Twitch. But... Uh, We'll see if that happens. Anyway, this has been enough for me. I'll see you guys next week.